where, where are you, Jeannie, in the U.S.? Because I'm also on Eastern time at 6.30 here in oh, Toronto. In New, in New York? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Coast. What? Say that coast. again, sorry. I said she's all the way on the East Coast. Yeah, yeah. Where are you? You're located in? I mean, I'm also on the East Coast. I'm in Toronto, in Canada. Yeah, okay. I, I knew you were in Canada, but I wasn't sure which part of Canada you were in. Okay, East, East yeah. Coast, yeah. Got it. My um, partner's oh, from Detroit, so she's oh, a lot of time in Canada. That's she's practically from... Canada. <laughs> yeah, that is, that is. I'm not East Coast, I'm probably East Central, I guess, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah Detroit, actually, I went there about two years ago in the summer, it could be the summer of 2019, and I went to the Art Institute there, and it was stunning, and they had oh, yeah. an Impressionist exhibit, and they have a real um, art scene, like they've gentrified certain areas. There was a, a an area that was very bad, supposedly, but it's some kind of art haven now for like street yeah. art and stuff. She, um, you know, she went to art school there and she grew up there. She lived there until she was 30, 32. Um, she's super still involved in the art scene there. It's very different than the West Coast. This isn't an, an in general statement, though. The East Coast art scene is way more intense than the West Coast art scene. Um, and I think there are, are good things and bad things. I'm excited. We're going in September. I'm excited to see um, a lot of the things that are there. Because, you know, in Portland, we really, or in Oregon in general, we really only get what Portland Art Museum brings in, which isn't a lot. Um, so we don't get to see a lot of really good stuff unless we go somewhere else. So, oh yeah, um, the, I think it's the Detroit Art Institute. They have a huge installation by that guy Diego, who was married to Rita. Diego yeah. Rivera. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I wasn't familiar with him, but the thing is massive because he had done it based on what he saw at Ford. I guess they had commissioned him to do that. Yeah, actually, you should really. It's it's an interesting thing because he did like a United States tour. He got commissioned by a bunch of businesses to do murals, but a lot of them got canceled because there's political leanings, but uh, and so it's exciting that they they still have that. Yeah, her family is very like old school Ford. You know what I mean? Like yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. it's okay. a whole room. It's a whole room of him. It's quite impressive. Yeah, his work is really really impressive. Even though he's totally a chauvinistic a hole. I mean, his work is great. You can't deny that. Um, <laughs> yeah, we're gonna, we're yeah. Gonna, I didn't read as much, but I'm sure he is. Yes. Okay. <laughs> we're gonna start. Um, we're gonna start with a video today, not because this is actually, so we are um, gonna be used, we're gonna be doing some exercises based off the work of Jean-Michel uh, Basquiat. And it's important, um, a couple of things, obviously we're gonna start with a short video because his life is remarkable. Um, you know, he was uh, an artist who kind of came to fame in the eighties. He was actually um, born in 1960. And he rose really quickly, really young. He actually was the youngest artist to um, exhibit at the Whitney Biennial in New York and at the Whitney Museum of American Art. Um, he also was the youngest artist to take part in an international um, art festival at 21. It was like a really big deal. His, his career is very interesting to look into. I've spent a lot of time reading about it this, this week. Um, I'm trepidatious, honestly, about his work because I feel very precious about it, which there's very few artists I feel truly precious about. Um, I think because he died so young and because I feel like his career was exceptional um, and he is truly a genius, um, you know, he, similar to Frida even, has been very commercially taken advantage of since his death. And so I, I was hesitant to teach his work and to teach this exercise, but I love this exercise. And so I'm hoping that we can work through it together and, and do it in ways that are true to ourselves that aren't just copying his work. But we're going to start with a short video just so that we can learn a little bit more about his life. And then I will lay out um, the exercises that I have done today. I do want to say hello to Christina. I know she just came off the video, but I haven't seen you in my class before. It's exciting to have you here. Um, welcome. 
uh, what we're doing right now generally is, is that we're studying an abstract artist each week and then we're doing some exercises based off their work. So this week is uh, Jean Sebastien. And we're gonna watch this wonderful TEDx because what else would we do? Hold on, let me share my screen. <laughs> I love being able to deep dive these artists each week um, and, and find, you know, such good value. A sky blue canvas ripped open by an enormous skull teeth bared through visceral slashes of oil and spray paint. In 2017, this untitled artwork was auctioned off for over $110 million. But it's not the work of some old master. These strokes of genius belong to 21-year-old Black Brooklynite Jean-Michel Basquiat, one of America's most charismatic painters and currently its highest sold. Born in 1960 to a Haitian father and a Puerto Rican mother, Basquiat spent his childhood making art and mischief in Borum Hill. While he never... Oh, sorry. Oh, clearly we're going to have this happen. Mm -hmm. My fault. Give me a second. Sorry attended about that. art school, he learned by wandering through New York galleries and listening to the music his father played at home. He drew inspiration from unexpected places, scribbling his own versions of cartoons, comic books, and biblical scenes on scrap paper from his father's office. But it was a medical encyclopedia that arguably exerted the most powerful influence on Basquiat. When young Jean-Michel was hit by a car, his mother brought a copy of Grey's Anatomy to his hospital bed. It ignited a lifelong fascination with anatomy that manifested in the skulls, sinew, and guts of his later work, which frequently explores both the power and vulnerability of marginalized bodies. By 17, he launched his first foray into the art world with his friend, Al Diaz. They spray painted cryptic statements and symbols all over lower Manhattan, signed with the mysterious moniker, Samo. These humorous, profound, and rebellious declarations were strategically scattered throughout Soho's art scene. And after revealing himself as the artist, Basquiat leveraged Samo's success to enter the scene himself, selling postcards, playing clubs with his avant-garde band, and boldly seeking out his heroes. By 21, he turned to painting full-time. His process was a sort of calculated improvisation. Like beat writers who composed their work by shredding and reassembling scraps of writing, Basquiat used similar cut-up techniques to remix his materials. When he couldn't afford canvases, he fashioned them out of discarded wood he found on the street. He used oil stick, crayons, spray paint, and pencil, and pulled quotes from the menus, comic books, and textbooks he kept open on the studio floor. He kept these sources open on his studio floor, often working on multiple projects at once, pulling in splintered anatomy, reimagined historical scenes, and skulls transplanted from classical still lives, Basquiat repurposed both present-day experiences and art history into an inventive visual language. He worked as if inserting himself into the legacy of artists he borrowed from, producing collages that were just as much in conversation with art history as they were with each other. For instance, Toussaint Louverture versus Savonarola and Undiscovered Genius of the Mississippi Delta offer two distinct visions of Basquiat's historical and contemporary concerns, but they echo each other in the details, such as the reappearing head that also resurfaces in PPCD. All these pieces form a network that offers physical evidence of Basquiat's restless and prolific mind. These chaotic canvases won rapid acclaim and attention, but despite his increasingly mainstream audience, Basquiat insisted on depicting challenging themes of identity and oppression. Marginalized figures take center stage, such as prisoners, cooks, and janitors. His obsession with bodies, history, and representation can be found in works evoking the Atlantic slave trade and African history, as well as pieces focusing on contemporary race relations. In less than a decade, Basquiat made thousands of paintings and drawings, along with sculpture, fragments of poetry, and music. His output accelerated alongside his meteoric rise to fame, but his life and work were cut tragically short when he died from a drug overdose at the age of 27. After his death, Basquiat's work only increased in value, but the energy and flair of his pieces have impacted much more than their financial worth. Today, his influence swirls around us in music, poetry, fashion, and film, and his art retains the power to shock, 
inspire and get under our skin. If you want to keep exploring the world of art and artists, check out this playlist. Okay, so we're going to look at some of, of his work because it's really, truly extraordinary. Um, and then I have a great exercise um, based off of his work that I think we'll, we will be able to enjoy very much together. Um, I really, I have used this website a lot. I just wanted to share this website, which is called WikiArt. Um, it has been really useful when I am uh, lo looking up artists and I want to look at their full body of work, which I think is often very important. Oh, hold on. There's a fire truck coming. Fire trucky kind of day today. Sorry, folks. <laughs> Um, so I want to look through some of his work. Let's, and th then talk about a couple of things that are going to be really important when we, um, do this exercise today, because the thing about, about his work is that he uses the concept of pictograms to tell stories that are really important. Um, a lot of his work was dichotomous it would be about wealth and poverty it would be about race relations and it would be about really important social issues it's important when when we're going to do exercises based off of famous artists like this that we consider telling our own stories and stories that are specific to our lives not in copying the stories that these artists um, do work about um, it's especially important with um, somebody as well known as Jean-Michel that we don't, we try hard to stay away from some of the symbols that he uses. So he's known for the crown symbol. It is like a universal, it's, it was in a ton of his work. And if you, we're gonna view all 156, um, we're gonna look for one that has it in it. See God and Law, this is an interesting painting where we can really see the dichotomy that he's using here. He's also known for using whatever materials he had because in the beginning he was very poor and he would salvage a lot of um, materials from the streets of uh, New York City. So you can see the crown is here and the, the helmet for Aaron right here. And uh, it's in a lot of his um, later life work and it's really known as being kind of a symbol of him. So much so that when um, Banksy did a tribute to uh, Jean-Michel, he did a, a stencil of a, a Ferris wheel and each seat, instead of a seat, it was a crown. And then it was like a line of people lining up. And it was really a, a conversation about the commodification of an underrepresented artist post death, right? Um, you can see the crown right here very much, you know, very apparent. He uses it in a lot, you know, as they said in the, in the show, they very much, he very much repeated concepts that he was looking for. One of the things that I really appreciated that I learned about him was, so I knew he was associated with Andy Warhol and the end of his life, he spent a lot of time with Andy Warhol. And it's actually said that um, Andy Warhol's death was part of the impetus that ended up in, in Jean-Michel's death because um, he was trying to stay sober um, yeah. and, and struggling with, with heroin addiction. And as anybody who has spent any time in these communities knows, if you're struggling, you come off of heroin and come back on heroin, you're a lot more likely to overdose. And that is actually what happened for him. He actually lived in an apartment the end of his life that he got from Andy Warhol. Um, they were very close. But one of the things that, I, one of the stories that I heard was one of the ways when he was introduced to Andy Warhol that he made a connection with Andy Warhol was he went out and drew a, a, a portrait like a, a picture of Andy Warhol Jean-Michel and there was one more person there all three of them together it was really it's really heartwarming to me the ways in which he used his art to connect um and I think it's really important not only is he using his art to talk about really serious issues that are important to him like race he was um Puerto Rican and Haitian so he spoke three languages he spoke French Spanish and English fluently and, um, you know, I think if anybody really falls into the category of radiant child, you know, and this concept of child genius, it's definitely him. His work, like they said, made 
almost 200 pieces in the short period of time. I think it was like five years previously that he was a professional artist. See, these ones are really sweet. The Sugar Ray Robinson one. Um, ironically, you know, now that Leah talked about the whole boxing thing last time um, with the little skeleton. So because I want us to be conscious of what, um, how we can tell our stories and not try and just tell his stories, I've worked up an exor exercise that I hope um, allows us to use some of the things that he does and have some of the freedom that he has in his um, artwork, but make it personal to us. So let me pull up my notes for myself. I often make little notes for myself so that I know. Um, so some of the things that you're probably gonna need today is you're gonna need some acrylic paint. You can use watercolor um, as well if you would like, but you're really gonna want black acrylic paint. Um, he used a lot of black, obviously. You don't want some sort of crayons or I have oil pastels, um, you know, the water soluble pastels that I use. I also have some watercolor pencils, mainly because I wanna have multiple weights of lines, um, the ability to do that. And then I have um, some graphite pencils. I have some chalk, you know, a, a pretty good plethora uh, of um, things to, to kind of work this work with. We're gonna start first with our brainstorming step. So as we talked about, um, you know, his work was, is very similar to pictograms. This idea that you use things like emojis. Emojis actually came into being based off of pictograms um, that we use symbols and, and ideas to tell a story. So we're gonna brainstorm for ourselves. Um, for our paintings today. I have set up three because as you know, as, he as we talked about in the video and as you know, in general, I like to work on several at once. Usually only one comes out looking anything like what I want it to. We're gonna be telling a story here. Um, it may be easier for you to think of a personal story, but what I did was I chose one of my very favorite um, kind of mythological folklore stories. And I'm going to do my paintings based off of that story. Um, I thought it would be easier if I told you guys my story and so you could work, see how I work through it um, in this way. So my, one of my favorite stories is the story of Skeleton Woman. Um, it's an Inuit story about a um, Inuit uh, fisherman who was fishing out in the sea in his boat and he uh, felt his fish pole catch on something and he felt it and it was really heavy and he was getting really excited and he was getting really really pumped thinking that it was going to be the big fish and he's pulling it up pulling it up pulling it up and as the the, the thing comes crusting out of the water it's actually a wrangled up mangled up bunch of bones he gets really scared he drops his pole it's in his boat and then he starts hurriedly trying to go back to shore however the bones are still attached to his fishing pole which is in his boat and clank clanking behind are skeleton woman's body all mangled up into one ball. He um, is so frightened as he sees the skeleton popping through the water behind him that he grabs his pole and starts running to his hut, dragging skeleton woman behind him. Um, he get, gets through the door, he throws his fishing gear um, right next to the fireplace and he goes into the corner as he's very afraid of this bag of, of bones. As he starts to light the fire and put tea on at night, he starts to look at the bag of bones and he sees that it is a woman's set of bones. I'm not sure how he saw that, okay? That's the part of the story I've always wondered about. Starts to- It's the pelvic bone. <laughs> he saw Sorry, I'm, so, I'm being the smart ass. <laughs> yeah, so he's untangling her. And as he's untangling her, he is overtaken by the grief of the, the set of bones that are in front of him. And as he starts to cry his tears, start to regenerate the bag of bones and the bones come back to be as skeleton woman. Um, and then of course the concept of the story is, is that she speaks with him and they get married and they have a life. Um, the story, what it's really about and what's, why I love it so much is about the concept of life, death, life. Meaning that sometimes life can only come from death. And, and it's this uh, concept I think about a lot as a, a child who lost their parent very young. So I'm gonna be working with that story because I think it's a really beautiful story. It's gonna be really easy for the kinds of concepts that we're going through today. Um, so 
I'm going to spend some time brainstorming a symbol about my story, words related to my story, and then I'm going to be thinking about, as you have noticed in looking at some of Beth's, at, of some of John Michelle's work, is that um, there is always a central character. So I'm going to, we're going to figure out how to bring our central character into being. I'm going to give you guys five minutes to work on some of your symbols. I really think it's helpful if you like write some notes down for yourself about your story. And then what we're going to do is we're going to come back together and we're going to work on that main silhouette first. Because this is where the impact of his work can really be felt, which is this, this dark black acrylic outline that he then uses the texture of crowns and oil pastels on top of to bring to kind of life. Um, does anybody have any questions? And then, then we'll, I'll shut up for a little bit so you, we can all work on kind of brainstorming what kind of symbols we want to use, what kind of words. You can tell us, you can use a story as similar to like how, how I have, or you can use a personal story in your life. Or also consider a juxtaposition if it if it has to do with your life, similar to like money and you know the the scales of justice and that kind of thing. Okay. Is everybody yes, yes, I see you nodding heads. Great. Okay. So we're all gonna take five minutes and start helping ourselves by brainstorming a little bit.
Let's Okay, so it's been about five minutes. I'm just going to um, show or talk to you a little bit about some of the things I brainstormed from my story. And then I'm going to start working on my silhouette. I know personally uh, that the silhouette part of this painting is going to be the hardest part for me. I don't paint a lot of skeletons in my work. Um, and I also know that it's one of the most important parts of this kind of work. So um, I some of the some of the things that I brought out from the story that I'm going to bring into um, my painting is the obviously the skeleton woman herself. Uh, some of the verbs or, or kind of terms that I'm going to use is the term life, death, life, which is what the story is about, obviously, and the repetition of the, the word clank, clank, clank. Um, I think that some other things that I might consider, depending on how I do the actual outline of my skeleton body, is actually what Leslie said, something about the pelvis, right? That's a really interesting kind of thing to think about, and I might highlight that after my black paint dries. I also worked with several different sketches of a, of a boat, like a fishing boat, and what I found um, also with this, also the fascination of the fishing hook, right, which is what she's caught on, is the way that you can kind of distill the boat illustration down into almost a fishing hook illustration. And I probably will use that in my painting because I think that's a really interesting um, flow of, of work for me. Um, so the first thing that we're gonna do is that we need our black paint to dry. Um, we need to be able to outline our uh, character um, and let it fully dry. So I'm going to use this matte acrylic black, you know, because I don't really like black paints as I've, I've mentioned before. And I'm going to kind of work on the skeleton woman's, um, I'm going to actually pull up a drawing of a skeleton, which is something I often do because I really don't know how this one might look. I have a uh, like a wooden one that I would probably use to to figure it out, and then I'm going to kind of start to block it out. Um, we'll see how well this part goes. That's why I have three different paintings, right? Is that uh, I don't know how it's going to come out. It could come out really terribly, or it could come out really awesomely. Um, so what I'd like you to consider is in your stories, um, what is this? character that you're going to have or what is this person this theme um, and start to kind of block it out this is going to be just the background so that we can after it dries um, add words and kind of phrases to it um, does anybody want to share maybe if they chose a story if it's personal or not some of the symbols that they kind of came up or with or some of the ways that the brainstorming that they came up with 
You don't have to if you don't want to. I won't make you, but sometimes it's nice to work through it with other people. Okay. <laughs> oh. I, I will. Let me just sh sh get a shot. I'm a day late and a dollar short today, people. You know what? Uh, we're not going to hold it against you. It's Tuesday. You know? Yay! We're just here to, to kind of play like we're little kids for, you know, two hours in, in a week. I need some juice! <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, right? Maybe that right? the next thing is you need to start uh, bringing your own uh, juice and or cocktails, depending on what, what you do or don't drink. Well, I'm dying for a cocktail. I won't get shit done if I start drinking. Um, so I was, I was thinking about, um, Cuomo resigning. Yeah. And, uh, I think it's a really important thing to be talking about. It's a great, oh, I just, I just sent you my sketch. He has such an angular face and his, I made his hands really big because he's so grabby. <laughs> yeah. And then all the women around him are looking very sad. I like that. I like I like the personalization of it. Oh yeah. Okay. Oh, I love it. I love the words. Yeah. Why is it not popping up in my feed? Oh, I was. I think I was looking at your stuff, Les. I haven't seen. Oh. Those Are you in the wrong feed? No, I'm in abstract art. I oh, mine, mine, I might have. I thought I put it in here. Was that Jeannie who said she sent that Cuomo? Yeah. yeah. I don't see okay. it. I just sent, I just resent it. I probably sent okay. it in the wrong thread. Perfect. Oh my gosh. I really <laughs> like the way that. Oh, here it is. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I love it. The hands. The hands. <laughs> so good. And um, it's interesting about, you know, like this style of work, you also have the ability. I mean, because you're layering images, they're not meant to come together as a composition in a normal storytelling format. You could also just do the hand. That yeah. becomes one of your symbols because of the story at hand. Um, you know, it's, it's a weird thing. We got so much going on right now. We have such fodder for uh, this kind of work because of COVID, because of politics, because of the last uh, year in general, right? So uh, definitely yeah. free to, to use things that you can feel it, you know, good and attached about. Something that I'm discovering as I'm working on this and I'm creating this kind of, these silhouetted characters, don't forget that they don't have to look beautiful and perfect, right? This is uh, you know, this type of work is wild and free. Um, don't get stuck on the details. Don't get stuck um, trying to make it look like something that is uh, recognizable, is what I'm trying yeah. to say. Okay, so why don't you, um, I love these. I love all of these ideas. Les, do you wanna talk more about, about your, um, where you're coming from with the yeah the words. so uh last weekend i went on a trip with rachel down to corvallis and we stayed in Phil philomath we went to visit our friend katie who we haven't seen and it just was so nice to be out on the road again and just mm -hmm. it was it was like i don't know why it was just so fantastic because it's been so long but rachel's really easy to travel with and i love road trips and we hit a bunch of nurseries and Katie mm -hmm. made us these awesome vegan meals out of her garden, and we had beer, and you know, it was just so relaxing. And um, I've been working on this piece that, and it's the big, I think I just sent it, it's that big pick. And I, I want to somehow relate that to all the landscapes that we saw, and that just that peaceful, restful feeling I get from gardening, because things have been super stressful around here, like with the heat mm -hmm. and my mom and my job and just fucking life in general. Excuse my French, you know, so I'm trying to get away from like 
pouring that negativity into some artwork and instead try to focus on something green. Does that make sense? You know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, we have to realize, I mean, which I know that we have talked about several times in this class, but it's just the reality is, is that what we've been through is super traumatic. Um, yeah. Our bodies are dealing with it. The earth is experiencing a lot of trauma right now with the climate issues and you know, for those people on the East, East Coast, it's, it's wildfire season right now. And it's a very stressful time when you live on the West Coast in the middle of wildfire season. Um, my girlfriend's mother moved here from Michigan and we definitely looked at routes in comparison to where the wildfires were because we didn't want her to have to drive through those wildfires. So Yeah, and it's so smoky too, in like yeah. across the country. I know that um, we went to a concert for the first time this weekend. Well, it was nice. our second but it was a like, big venue and it was the first concert that the wonder ballroom has had since COVID. Shut them oh down. cool and it we everybody wore masks it was it was great in that way but it is scary and it is yeah. stressful to be in environments that previously were so joyful i still however found a lot of joy in that so i love the idea that you're gonna you're gonna concentrate on something that's joyful and about kind of yeah bringing that back in you know that's kind of the opposite how i usually am you know <laughs> it's kind of sarcastic and cynical so i'm trying to change my way right <laughs> no that i think that's what's beautiful is is that yeah. it, it's fine if his work was dark and you know he had a very interesting life he left home yeah because i mean i thought hip Basquiat's work had a lot of joy in it there was a lot of pain as well i always felt but, but again, similar to Skeleton Woman, do you yeah. really have joy without pain? We yeah, exactly. Know, we wouldn't know. You wouldn't be able to have this place with your, with this experience. It wouldn't be the same if you hadn't just gone through the, the pain that you've been going through. Yeah, so, yeah. Well, and that's the whole thing. I was talking about that at the dog park today with somebody. It's just like, the older I get, the more that I find the good things that come out of trauma. Yeah. You know, like when my dad died, my brother and I started talking again. You know, he still drives me crazy, but you know, we didn't talk for 10 years and that was the good thing about my dad dying, you know? And yeah, right? Yeah, I mean, it's a really, I think that's, I was reading this very interesting article by somebody who got sober during the pandemic. And wow. that is, sounds to me, sober during the pandemic in a house uh, with parents who are alcoholics. And their article- so tough but so beautiful what a, what a resilient human being what what a human what a beautiful thing to take your life and and value it so much that you you would choose this time to do it right um so i think that these things can be joyful um and i'm excited to see mm -hmm. maybe how that works out for you why don't we work on i have three different versions of trying to get my um skeleton woman kind of on the page um, and I'll send some photos for you guys and you can see. Okay. You'll want to let the the outline dry. That's why we're doing it first instead of starting to work with the symbols and the imagery next. Mm -hmm. So why don't we start with that and then uh, we'll let them dry for a little bit and contemplate how we're going to bring in some of the other exciting things. And okay. I just was going to say those semicircles and those those round pieces were like sort of a representation of a bowl. And then also the moon, you know, because I feel like a bowl is really full, right? You can have yeah. a bowl with food. It's, it's always a good thing with a bowl, right? So, and I then it also can represent the sun, the yeah. brownness, yeah. I think, it's a, you know, things like that become symbols of important things. I did a, an art show about trauma, about generational trauma. Yeah, and I use the image of cups overflowing, stacked on. Oh, I like it. Water. Like, you know, the the trauma starts here and then it comes here and it builds more because that person has their own trauma and then it continues down, it keeps doing that. I love using household objects to symbolize um, emotional experiences. Well, and what I love about his work too is the asymmetry of it. I have a lot of, 
I want things to be super balanced a lot, you know, to almost, right. even though I'm a figurative artist, I like that symmetry, you know, of the balance. And I want to get away from that. Like, it's okay if one side has too much on it, right? Yeah, well, and remember, like, sometimes, um, so balance doesn't have to be uh, in terms of fullness of page, okay? Right. With abstract art, it's a great opportunity to consider how balance might be about the full experience. Yeah. So sometimes it's about the ratio of really big marks to really small marks. Yeah. Um, and like super bright colors to neutrals. Maybe it would help. I mean, maybe it'd be interesting for you to challenge yourself in experiencing different concepts of what balance are. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Balance well, that's like I've been looking at a lot of Dorothy Fratt's work lately. You know, oh, I love big that. expanses of gray and that little tiny bit of yellow and then something over here. And I'm like, it's brilliant. You know, I wish I could have seen her paint, right? <laughs> I didn't even know about her work until recently. Till, I mean, seriously, like two months before I mentioned her in class. I yeah. obsessed with her work. Yeah, um, I do. <laughs> She's so good. Uh, you know, that's the thing, though, we, when we talk about some of these artists that are just pure geniuses. Right. Um, I do want to mention some thoughts about um, this and the background colors. This is a great opportunity when we consider the, the, the natural tendency um, to, to, to do juxtapositions. Um, color juxtapositions are a great opportunity here. You know, thinking about our color theory concepts, thinking about on the color wheel colors that are opposite of each other that can bring out some real serious power. Obviously, we know like like blue and orange are a great example of that. Um, and consider when what what I'm going to suggest and what I think works best for this project in this class for this experience is use watercolor or use some kind of colored pencils or graphite pencils. Use your crayons. This is when you bring in your symbols and your words and yeah. then let it dry and use watercolor on top to create the large punches of color. I think in this experience, instead of blocking it out or creating some kind of background and working on that, that it might be easier oh, for yeah. right? okay. the symbols and the words first. Mm -hmm. So um, I would love to see anybody's yeah. silhouette as they're coming through. Obviously, we have the what's up uh, thread that you can throw it on. Um, and then I, uh, I threw my little silhouettes. They're drying pretty quickly because it's, uh, once again, very hot right now in the Pacific Northwest. So hopefully I'll be able to nervously work on the insides of them. Because <laughs> that feels like a super stressful thing for me. We're going to see how it all comes out, right? I love the big hands. I'm really into the big hands. Okay, I love is it, is it, does it feel stressful to, to be in that part of the country during, during something like this? Um, it's not so much that it's stressful as, as I feel vindicated. Yeah. You know, okay. I, I've, I've been so angry about it. Mm -hmm. and, and the fact that he he quit today made me happy. So even though this this all looks very angry, there, it, there's actually some joy in depicting him this way. You know, this is part of the woman experience, right? This mm -hmm. uh, frustrating experience that repeats itself. I was um, watching a very interesting live feed about um, how some uh, white women profit off of the ideas and the work of women of color mm -hmm. and in the workplace and, and every day. And I've been thinking about this, just this universal experience of what the woman was speaking about. It's, it's difficult to be an anti-racism work, which is the work that she's in, um, because you feel like nothing changes like you're constantly doing the work and then there's these gestures that are surface level and then it just repeats itself 
you know, this experience that with, with Como is like, I feel like we're just constantly repeating ourselves. Right. It's so. like, how could, he, how could he have gotten away with it for so long? And nobody said anything. Well, like, uh, didn't we have people me lied for him. Yeah. And people anything. were scared of him because he's a bully. He's a yeah. bully. Can we talk about the woman who has yep. been, I mean, yeah. And she yeah. came first. Like, thanks, sister, right? <laughs> right? It's very, um, but that's where that socialization really goes real far, right? Is like, it's in, inbred in people, right? Ugh. Well, it's just unfortunate that women continue to not support each other. And that, you know, can be defined in many ways, such as whatever her name was, the assistant mm. seemed very complicit. I mean, that's just shocking to me. Yeah. I, yeah. You know, it's heartbreaking to me. It's not that I don't think that it happens. It's just that I'm like, oh, how can we do that to each other? Uh, yeah, it's, um, I think about that. I mean, I mean, honestly, even with the vaccines, um, I was listening to someone talk about how it was an older white guy, how he had gotten the vaccine, but he told his children not to get the vaccine. And I just thought to myself, like, you're just shooting your kids in the foot. Like, yeah, yeah. why wouldn't your, your 23 year old and 28 year old sons get it? it you, clearly it's good enough for you, right? You got it. And I just wonder about how we do that. You know, we get stuck up in these ideas of, about things. And we repeat their 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 problems. Sometimes when I'm doing exercises like this, I try to force myself to use tools that I wouldn't previously use or colors I wouldn't previously use. Um, I think it's always so interesting how you can. Um, challenge yourself, you know, when it doesn't feel as important, right? Because it's not your original ideas, right? Okay. Is Leah here today? She has some friends over if we need anything. Oh, oh okay. Yeah, she's, she's doing her thing. This is kind of the nice part, right? Is that uh, when she needs to take the time, she can. Yeah. I know it's a little, a little hard without her filling up the air. <laughs> I'm going to run around and get a pencil. I am using, I got a white watercolor pencil here. That's pretty amazing. I have to tell you. Feeling oh, I have one of those. <laughs> God knows where it is. Right? That's the thing. Okay. And then... So I'm starting to outline parts of, of my skeleton woman body um, using the white pencil so that it stands out. Uh, obviously, I don't know how to draw a skeleton, so I'm trying to reference skeleton drawings. <laughs>
In this first uh, kind of iteration of this, because I'm going to work through several iterations, I'm focusing on the ribs. I think a lot about this concept of Eve coming, you know, from the rib, uh, from the Bible. It's always interesting to think about how different cultures, stories come together, you know. Bringing in all the water stuff. I like your skeletons. So far, this first one's interesting. Um, you know, I can tell that this is the kind of thing that I'd have to do repeatedly to really flush out um, the ideas, what kind of symbols and such I might use. I'm excited to paint the background a little bit and with some washes so that I can play with color and kind of little drawing things on it a little bit too. Um, see how far I can take it.
very interesting. My skeleton looks a little on the fierce side from this this version. It's like uh, seems like I'm I've been watching too much charm, which I have been. Um, and it's coming through in my drawings here. going to let this dry a little bit and uh, come in for some more symbols and some more probably text. Yeah, but I'll send you all a picture on the old WhatsApp app. Okay. So I posted my current in progress shot of the first piece, just so everybody knows it's on there. I went ahead and did the wash, and then I think I'm going to come back through with something that I feel like has a heavier um, weight than the graphite pencil that I previously used for the letters. I'd like them to stick out a little bit. I think a lot when you're working with text, you need to be considerate of the, the 
weight of the actual line that is creating the text. Yeah. I would do a lot more text if I was a better, if I had better handwriting, a more unique handwriting. Um, I just don't, I don't got the right handwriting for it, you know? On the second one that I'm working on, I've decided to try things a little differently. And I'm going to lay down acrylic paint as my background kind of big paint. And I'm going to do it first so that I can use my watercolor pencils on top of it. They're kind of chalky. Um, and we'll see if it's better or if it's worse.
That's better. <laughs> oh, it's a struggle. This one's, these are, you know. This is, yeah, it's the big black lines. I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> this is one of those spots, you just gotta be like, okay, I gotta let go here, you know. Well, I'll, I'll send a picture over. Where's my damn phone? <laughs> it's right in front of me, Jesus. There are there are definitely parts of the like the pieces that I have that I like. Oh, I actually really like that. I feel like that was really su successful. And parts that I'm like, not sure what I was doing there. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, as I've mentioned before, I'm not really the biggest fan of working with the black. However, what I've learned is is that I do like to kind of draw on top of the black so there are parts that i really love yeah i'm waiting for this big black part to dry yeah that but i took some pink over my word flow and i like it better so and i use the brayer on it well oh, the brayer is always it's answer. really bright it's super 80s <laughs> uh one of mine is is super bright i definitely went with uh you know neon fluorescent red and uh cerulean blue yeah and see, see how that feels because those color colors are more in my palette um it's interesting when you think about something for this long like you know we're thinking about um this one story for this long i'm gonna try and move my well, i like that big block of orange on the one that's up, probably your far right yeah, it's really nice, and you can't see it, but I'll send a picture of it. I'm trying to give you guys better shots of all of them. It's really what I'm trying to do. Move this. We'll go like this. See if that does better. I'm going to kind of work on all three of them. Um, pick otter. Some thoughts that I'm having. I'm interested. Uh, how are how are you guys feeling about the the stories that you're telling? Do you feel like the more you think about them, the more clear they become or the less clear they become? Um, at this point, I'm gonna say less clear than what I thought, but. Right. I'm not hating it. No. But it's not really, because I thought it would have like more of a, like a nature-y flow, but it's not that, but I don't not, I don't hate it. Right. Like it's doesn't have a lot of green in it. <laughs> oh yeah. You know, I chose I'm kind of clearly feeling this orange thing. I feel like it's a really powerful color. Yeah. I feel like skeleton woman's a powerful story. Christine, how are you doing? Not to call you out totally. You don't have to answer if you don't want to, that's for sure. That's okay. It's just my first art class ever. <laughs> oh, well, welcome. You know, it's probably a pretty good- She one. gave me Basquiat right off. <laughs> a little. <laughs> I might touch. I just put a lot of color on a piece of paper and we'll see how it goes. I like that. That's, that's all you can do. The nice part about abstract art, you know, and kind of the hardest and the nicest is that it really is just about the decisions that you make, you know? But, his work is actually really great first time work because you can really work to explore. It's not supposed to look perfect. It's right. Supposed to, yeah. You know. I can pass it off as a deliberate thing, supposed oh, to a right. Part, right? <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> but it's fun. <laughs> it's fun. That's, That's what it's about. I'm about. using my children's uh, pastels too. I don't have any of my own. <laughs> oh, nice. Good that they have them, right? Yes, this is true. I have um, I have watercolors, but pastels. Hey, that's perfect because then what's going to happen is the watercolor will fill it around the pastel, but it'll come off the pastel because naturally, 
the oil will keep it off. Kind of perfect together. Yeah, I didn't. Um, yeah, I, I didn't bring out the watercolors today. Just the pastel. We'll see how it happens. Well, this whole class is always about use what you what you have. Um, I just happen to have a lot because I do this all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I try not to do too much. I try to kind of consistently use the same material. Um, but I don't. I use these water soluble oil pastels. Um, and there are green changes in the I think sometimes. Okay, I just have um, whatever these are. <laughs> I went through a pastel phase and I just never really, I tried really hard to get good at it and I never really did. <laughs> you almost can't go wrong. They're always such pretty colors though. And the, the pigments are so solid. Yeah, they're so rich, but I, I really don't know anything. <laughs> Well, I guess you're going to learn it over time. We talk a lot about materials and that kind okay. of thing. So welcome. I'm glad that you're here today. Thank you so much. I, I joined the press club um, and I, I was happily surprised yeah. that this was a benefit. Isn't it, it's oh, an interesting cool. benefit. I wish I had the jobs that I'd had previously in my life in art classes. What? Come on. I actually... Um, only would teach once or twice a year before Leah sold me on, on doing this. Um, which is funny because I would do like workshops in my studio for a weekend or whatnot. But it's been really fun to create a weekly class and to explore the artwork of so many different amazing artists. We did uh, Cy Twombly last week, which was really fun. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed that. Oh, he's so fun, you know. But, it was you know, fun. Here's the thing. Remember that Cy was pr producing work when uh, Basquiat was, was out there and being famous, you know? He very much was influenced by Cy, which is why they were kind of taught together. It's always, you know, it's always good to, to consider concepts concurrently, like symbolism. Symbolism is a hard thing to think about. I, um... You know, I've been painting uh, for 12 years now. I went, I graduated um, art school in 2010 with a sculpture degree and then self-taught myself to paint, which seems like a big waste of time. Why didn't I take painting while I was in college? I don't, I don't think so. <laughs> um, but I, over that time period, I kind of developed my own system of uh symbols that that come through truly in my work um that represent real real life things mind you they're a little different because my work is quite a bit less graphic um but they they do exist and these hopefully these classes as we go through them and we experience new ways of making work what you start to to learn about yourself is you know, your own kind of internal <laughs> abstract language. Um, that's really what we're working toward. My watch is telling me that I need to stand up and get moving. Get moving, lady. You're like, what? You don't know me. <laughs> yeah.
I think they're pretty bright though, Les. That pink yeah. is really tells me what you're trying to say. Oh, well, that, that's good to hear. Thank you. I, you know, I'm really bad about not plotting out my colors before. That's what I think gets away from me. It's, I just feel like there's too much color in it, you know? But sometimes, you know, that's, that's a real thing for some artists. And yeah. you, and limiting yourself can be really helpful. Um, but also, part of it is this is like these are bright paintings, they're meant to be kind of extreme. Okay. <laughs> I love the hands one, Jean. It makes me giggle very much. The, the big hands one, I like. I started off really liking it, but I think I made, I overdid them so much they look dull now. Well, you can always rework them though. Like you can redo them. You can redraw them on top of it when it dries. The mm -hmm. keeper is probably going to be letting it dry at this point. Just I, I actually like the third one the best, the one that was just the head with the little tiny hands. <laughs> I like the, is that like blood rain or? Oh Ooh. yeah, it's, it's, it's angry tears. Angry tears, yes, blood rain. <laughs> Same thing. I like, I like it. it. Yeah, I'm into it. I'm into the whole presentation of it. I think you did- the Colors really are great. Thank you. I um, am a compulsive documenter. Oh, hold on, my phone is. Give me a second, I gotta fix this. What have I done with this? What have I done with this? This is charging, so I don't know what your problem was. Being staffing or Um. What was I going to say? Oh, so I'm a compulsive documenter. Um, so, you know, I'm one of those weirdos that has like 30,000 photos on their page, on their phone. <laughs> but it also plays out in my artwork a lot because I, um, I collage and I do, you know, like these kinds of things are really about documenting our life because we kind of yeah. feel get how experiences feel you just move on to kind of the next set of experiences so i'm interested i love that you chose you chose something real in your life right now you know and that is um and then you're documenting it in these kind of images i've actually bought a book recently um that's stories that people stories from writing from people during COVID and it's from people who've like lost people during COVID, got COVID. And I bought it specifically because I didn't want to forget how this felt, you know? That makes sense, yeah. And I didn't, I didn't want to move so far away from it that it, that I could forget how hard it was. Oh, I don't need that either. Feel like this is a black ink situation. <laughs> Black paint can just feel so serious. You know, it's funny because when I do my nudes, I love a big black line around them, <laughs> but I don't like it in this. <laughs> it's, it's interesting how uh, different styles of work can challenge you in different ways, right? Yeah. Well, and that's why I wanted to take this class. I'm feeling much more inspired than I have been in a long time. Oh, I love hearing that. Yeah. yeah. I'm all about the process, really. Like, I, 
I love being an artist, but I also just love talking about the process with people and working through the process with them, you know? We, I have been thinking a lot about this comment. I think it, it was the art critic, Jerry, that was kind of his last name. I can't remember what his last name is, but he's, a, he's one of the few art critics left in the world, let me see. Yeah, they're you know, few and far between these days. Right. Uh, of course, I must not be in my own. I'm not. That's the problem. I was like, I know I follow him. Where has he gone? <laughs> Jerry Salt. I oh. find him to be very entertaining. He's been an art critic for a long time. It's definitely on the extreme side, which I uh, is good for me. Um, he, he posted this comment about the, the importance of artists focusing on the, the point of becoming artists, you know, the work that is becoming artists. And it has me thinking a lot about social media lately. Um, you know, a lot of artists that I know and a lot of artists that I work with are rethinking their relationship with social media because what has happened is it has replaced the part where you focused on becoming an artist, right? You focused on the work and the creation of the work and the failures. And there's so much pressure with social media to make something good the first time, you know? Yeah. Share it. And I've been thinking about that a lot because I do a lot of daily exercises to be a better artist. Mm -hmm. um, it, I, spend less time than one would imagine actually making paintings. Too busy trying. Well, I've always felt that those who are more prolific are often more successful. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like I look at Leah, who's self-taught, who paints every day. For hours a day. Not For hours. And I don't do that. I, uh, I yeah, she paints for hours a day. It's really quite amazing how much she she paints. I wish that I had a life that I could paint that much. Because yes, yes. This is the conundrum of being so good at being an arts administrator is I feel passionate about artists and artists being successful. And so I'm often in leadership roles that take up a lot of time, you know? Yeah. And my life as an artist suffers in julia cameron's book which is the artist's way if anybody's wondering uh she talks about she says that people like me uh are scared to be artists right or what artists scared to be oh, artists there yeah that we just fill it with other things my thing is just that i i want other artists to be so i want other artists to be successful so much that I do roles that I know many can't. It's always an interesting thing. I, uh, my goal right now is to paint 15 hours a week, which it's a I, lot. Should, but it should be in part of my life. If I, I'm a full-time artist. I don't, I mean, I work in a food cart because it's my friend's food cart and I like him, <laughs> you know, and he needs yeah. help now. But- uh, you get some free food. <laughs> I do. I get free lunch every day that I work, and I get good food. Yeah. I get to see people in my community, you know. But it definitely is probably stopping me from painting more than I'd like to know. See, these two are coming out nice. Uh, they look much better, honestly, on screen than they do in real in person. Um, there's definitely some successes and definitely some problems that could be worked out. <laughs> I'll share. Ooh. Oh, I love I love the freedom one with the cross out of COVID nineteen. Um, speaking of, I forgot to tell you congratulations, Canada, on winning the gold medal in women's soccer. Oh Big yeah. Deal. Big deal, my favorite soccer player of all time finally got her gold medal. Oh, who was that? <laughs> Sinclair. 
Oh, yeah. Yeah, they really did well. Yeah, Canada did well overall in the Olympics for a small country. I know. I was really, I was really proud of Canada. This is your first gold medal in women's soccer that I know of. This is like big, big. Yeah, it is. It is. You're right. Christine Sinclair is the captain of the Portland Thorns, which I had season tickets for, for several years. So I've seen her play consistently and always kind of am torn in general, I think, between Canada and the United States. I always want Canada to be successful. But I was very glad to see that Canada got gold this year. We can go to Canada now. Yeah, yeah. we can't come to you, though. We're not allowed to drive over still. That's so weird. Yeah, because our cases are not as bad as the U.S. and we have more folks that are vaccinated. It's yeah. anyway, that's weird. It's coming up August 21st, supposedly. So that's when you yeah. guys will be able to, to leave the country. Well, to drive over the border. We can fly. It's just it costs a lot to get tested. You have to pay for your tests to cross over. You got to pay for your tests to come back. Yeah. So that's like $400 kind of just to add on to your flight just for testing. That's a lot of money. It is. It is. I mean, they're actually recommending non-essential travel right now anyways, but I, I have friends who travel to see family, yeah. um, but they're, wi they're willing to pay the money and they have the money, so they're willing to do it. Yeah. Um, I think yeah, some people can't, they can't stay still, right? For very long, they need to leave. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's real. I'm amazed at how many people, I mean, we've done some traveling within the state, but we haven't left the state since COVID started. I will say though, we are going to Detroit in September. Um, part of that is we're both vaccinated, um, you know, but it's travel is a hard decision for everyone right now. I didn't realize that the borders were still locked for some reason. I thought that they had opened that part up again, but clearly I'm not in the know. Changes anyways. <laughs> it's just like, you know, it one day and then you don't know it the next because it's changed. So, it's, I mean, we're, we're dealing with this weird thing where states have to decide on a, like a, a county by county basis. Oh my yeah. God. I wow. just, I feel like the state of Oregon got sick and tired of being slammed for being locked down because they were locked down longer than other states. And they just gave up, you know? As a business owner, it's really hard. It's a hard decision how to protect my staff and how to protect, uh, you know, my the public coming in, but also still providing great opportunities and experiences with art. Artists have had such a hard time through this all. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, she just, Kate Brown just mandated statewide masks. Did you see that? No. Just today, like two or three hours ago. Yeah. Did she do it in state buildings though? Because that's just. She, she yeah. said all, all indoor venues in the United, in Oregon is what she said. And she wants all state workers vaccinated. And this is the issue at my job because we're technically I'm a public employee. I'm not a state worker because we're funded from the feds down to the state, right? So okay. I don't know what's happening. So it looks like she's going to announce new indoor mask requirements Wednesday. She's also yeah. requiring all employees to be fully vaccinated. I think this is going to be interesting. So I spent several hours yesterday um, reading ADA information about COVID. Yeah. Well, you know, as a business owner, we, we have a studio assistant. Not that, not that we have to worry about our studio assistant. She got vaccinated same time we got vaccinated. She's got a family member who's immunosuppressed. I mean, there's a lot, you know, I don't have to worry about that with her. But just kind of reading the, what you can and can cannot ask of people because of HIPAA yeah. and stuff like that. Very interesting. So, but it's going to be interesting. I think it should be, I think that it should be mandated for state employees, you know? Yeah. Well, they're not requiring vaccines at the college and at today's all staff meeting, which was before the announcement, they weren't even really considering telling people they had to be masked on campus. 
and the employees are pissed. They're like, what? what? Is it just that tuition has dropped so low that they- Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. And she just won't admit it. You know, our president. Yeah, that's unfortunate. Well, we'll see how it goes now, huh? Yeah, I guess. We'll see. So uh, right now I'm going back uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays, which is fine. I can handle that. Because there's nobody where I am. And I have my own office. You know, I can- Block myself. I think we're going to see some really hard social struggles coming out of this. This I agree. Yeah. I think it's also going to be interesting to see. We, we're going to run into the issue of. Uh, Unemployment ending and childcare not really being available yet for right. children. I know what's going to happen. What's going to happen? You know, we're going to have a bunch of homeless single moms. Is what's going to happen? That's exactly what's going to happen. It's it's super effective for um, the community we live in because single moms provide a very interest or moms mothers with children provide a yeah. very interesting influx to the service industry here, right? Yes. And since they're home with their children for summer and because of COVID, uh, and we don't have childcare options, there is, the service industry is decimated here. It's decimated well, everywhere. getting that way here. And plus, because yeah. there's nowhere for anybody, no one can afford to live. And if you're oh. going to get evicted, you won't find an apartment again anyway. If you can't pay your oh. rent, I'm just like, yep. it's like San Francisco. <laughs> you know, Oregon's become San Francisco. It, it really has. That's exactly how I feel. Kind of reminds me of like insects that feed on a place, use up all of its resources, and then go somewhere else. <laughs> yeah. I think in Canada, they've said federal federal employees and federally regulated employees would have to get vaccinated. So that would be like banks and any, anything that's regulated by federal government. That's an interesting one, huh? That's a great way to do it, though. Yeah. But I don't think it impacts like government employees in our province, right? Like in a state. So yeah. It'll be interesting to see because law firms, at least in Toronto, are starting to go back and some of them do want their people in already. It's interesting, you know, it's interesting about that. The first case in the United States, at least, where a business was requiring immunizations to come back to work with a law firm. So, huh? Yeah. The law firm thinks it's part of the culture, right? And they want billable yeah. hours and it's, I was supposed to go to a law firm. I didn't want to go and I didn't go, but they're like, oh, you can come see us. I'm like, no, thank you. <laughs> I mean, we're not allowed to anyways in Canada, but I was just like, I'm not going to any client to see anybody until 2022 at the earliest. Yeah. Except I might go to a patio lunch with some of them on Thursday. That's the only thing. That I'm okay because it's outdoors. Do you, are you guys experiencing the cultural pushback from people I feel like you guys have kind of your relationship to healthcare is different there so healthcare workers are really burnt out nurses are actually retiring or quitting we're having and some I think it's happening everywhere I don't I think they're just burnt out and it's yeah. just gonna get worse if this next wave is really bad which they're predicting in September it's um the the thing that I've that I've noticed is nurses are, are tired and exhausted caretaking for people who refuse to get the vaccine. That has been yeah. the experience in my social circle is that the ones that are getting frustrated are frustrated with people who refuse to get the vaccine and then the nurses have to caretake for them. Yeah. It's like you're putting us at risk, you know? I think it's, it's gonna be- I think we're going to culturally shift in general. Um, 
It's going to be hard. Well, I can't legally here at least ask you if you're vaccinated or not, but I know at Thompson Reuters, like, we have an office in Minnesota, mm -hmm. St. Paul, and I think cases are rising there. Okay. I, I think, but they, they're allowing employees that are vaccinated un, and not vaccinated, and they legally cannot ask you to do that. They, it's interesting. They, they I, like I said, I was reading about this a lot, and we come into the issues with the ADA policies where uh, the Disabilities Act protects health inf insurance information, health information. Um, they can't ask you, they can ask you if you've been vaccinated they have, they can require it for employment now. So it seems to be that this seems to be the wiki part. You can have it be required to get the job, but it seems like maybe you, it's a little harder for them to require everyone to get the vaccine, right? After they're employed. Uh, it's gonna be confusing for a while. It's interesting that Reuters has offices everywhere. So they're gonna have all kinds of different things they have to negotiate. How do you navigate that? like as one corporate entity. Because every state has different rules. Mm -hmm. It's not even just state, every country. Um, so globally, they have a lot of HR folks. Gosh, yeah. I think that, yeah, I, I, I don't know how they keep up, but it keeps changing. Cause I, I didn't realize that in the US they're more prone to go into the office. In India, you know, they have to pay for vaccinations cause vaccinations are not free there. So you see people asking how they can expense their vaccination. Oh, that's an interesting question, right? Because you can expense expense it here. Interesting. Oh, oh, ours are free in Canada. Ours are free, uh, but you have help. Your healthcare uh, needs can be expensed. Oh, ours cannot be. So. Well, you guys get it differently than we do. Think. Yeah, You're they're very they're different. Free. But that's very rare. It's not normal. You wouldn't have something like that that was free. It would either, you'd be arguing whether it was covered by your insurance and it, it's such a mess up. Healthcare here is a mess. Yeah, it's Christy, messed here too. Yeah. Christy, I did another one with the hands. Okay, I'm going bigger, in. The, like the hands more substantial to start with. I, I think it turned out better. Okay. This is, it definitely like, I see strengths in each of mine that I like. Um, and I can tell that this would be something I had to work through separately. Yeah. Do you like it better this way? Do you feel like, I feel like if your hands had, which I mean, it's fine that you don't have it, but if they had a, like a white pen over top of them. Oh yeah. You know what I mean? Like something to define the inner workings would be really interesting. <laughs> I'm gonna share where mine are right now. I like the clank, clank, clank on the one I'm about to send through. Don't like the skeleton at all. And I like that the life and the death are in two different colors, which I think is a really interesting juxtaposition. I'm getting such a weird collection of just random pieces that I make for this class. <laughs> Started keeping them and being like, when people come into my studio, they'll be like, oh, I like that. And I'll be like, oh, yeah, that was a demo for uh, this artist. <laughs>
Oh, Well, I gave the skeleton woman wings. <laughs> you know, I feel like they were appropriate. This is kind of my favorite one so far. We need a big reveal here, big reveal. I actually I quite like all of these now that I'm pulling them off and they have crystal lines, which is an affinity of mine. <laughs> nice. Kind of interesting, okay. <laughs> I'm gonna send you all photos of these. It's 522, so we're getting towards the end. Um, I would love to see, you know, what you have if you haven't shared it oh yay i've got some messages going i love the canada flag on it i think it was a really good one it's interesting uh the airplane with the heart oh separation oh my gosh bless talk about some color I know it's just so not like me. I just put a bunch of pink up in the right hand corner too. I, I don't. Uh. You know what's nice about it though? You when you talk about like pure joy, you talk about oh kind of, yeah. You know those colors really say that. Colors say a lot for a painting. Um, and I, I have to say I really like this color scheme for you. 
Yeah. yeah I, I love bought that. some of those, uh, what do you call those, that hot pink and hot green. Yeah, the fluorescents. Oh, yeah, thank you. It's just, I'm digging it. Man. I love them. They're my favorite. This um, hot fluorescent red flat golden. Is oh, yeah. Incredible. Wow. Um, it's a really fun um, color and I use it a lot. I use fluorescence in my work and I have it since I ever first started painting. They're not good for long-term effects, you know, but I do love them. They make me very happy. I have to say, I'm surprised at how satisfied I am with all of my paintings. I like these. I like the, the clank, clank, clank. I love the hook. Yeah. I know. It's, uh, I am more, I enjoy them more when I took the boat out of it. Oh, yeah. Oh, I love that, Christina. Oh. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, That's cool. Yeah. Colors are great. I'm into it. I think you did a great job with your uh, class boat. With my five colors. <laughs> Christina, you've never, you've never done an art great. boat before? No, but I. Great. That's amazing. It's a very good skull. That skull is fantastic. And so is the hook. I, th I think it's great. Yeah. I do really well when you take some of the other presentations. Thank you. Uh, it's fun. Plus, I've been working too hard. It's good to just like. <laughs> I think that is, you know, really where this class comes into play for, where this business comes into play for Leah is that. People do better when they have ways of de-stressing. And I um, got a class once that was just a sketchbooking um, exercises for people in high stress jobs, like doctors and the mental health therapists. Um, yeah. Actually, one of my students will be joining us when he gets when he gets back from his trip right now. Uh, he will start joining us and you'll get to see how fun it is to have him in class too. And he uses it to de-stress at work, and he is a nurse practitioner. So, yeah, yeah, this is good. This is my favorite one by far. Yeah, it's nice. Yeah, I love the colors. And that one, that one, the the pelvis is definitely feminine. Mm -hmm. You know, yes. really, you, you, I look at that and I know it's a woman. The others, I don't know. Right, and that one, you know, I said I was going to try that with them a, a little bit better. I think it's got weird ribs, but I kind of like the weird ribs. I think that's something that I, you know, I find this kind of work, the clank, the clank, 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 and actually allowing it to go over the skeleton's head was a big mm -hmm. change for me too. And I really think it's quite beautiful. Um, I still love the orange in this one though. I yeah, I love that orange with the yeah. black. That's why yeah. I think it really, mm -hmm. And it's interesting, the different manifestations of the life. So this one, I just did the life, death, life down here. And I did, you can't see it, but it says clank, 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 and pencil all along yeah. here. I didn't really like that. That's why I changed it to where the clank, clank, clank was super large. That's the best clank, clank, the yellow. Yeah, that is by far the best clank, clank. It's that yellow on top of that blue, I'm telling you. Um, yeah. This one has the best life, death, though, because it's in life is right here and death is right here. Mm -hmm. and um, juxtaposition of the colors the pink having the death and the dark amber having this like yeah. uh, and the hook is kind of it's like it's a sharp it's a barb you know yeah, it's you see the look yeah. there it's an interesting uh these are interesting how they came out um next week I have not chosen an artist yet. I want to do one more artist. I'm going to do some research, obviously. And I'm going to do one more artist that does similar stuff with symbolism. Um, and then the next three artists will be abstract painters that are more traditional, like Pollock. We will do a Pollock week. Uh -huh. and we'll do a Krasner week. Um, Leonora Carrington. Huh? Leonora Carrington. I'll look into it. She's you know? very surreal, very surreal. I love it. I think that it'll be fun to, you know, see where where we go from there. Um, it's been enjoyable to be able to- Yeah, good class. 
Well, I very much enjoyed it. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you, Leah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Thank I hope you. you all have a great week. Uh, Christina, keep keep coming to classes. Hi, oh, welcome, Christina. It's great. Thank We're, you. You're running me and Leslie in some other classes, too, I'm sure. So. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to try them all. Thank you. I love it. Nina, have a good weekend. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 This was fun. <laughs>